way to. Okay, so are you ready? Are you ready? We're gonna we're gonna start it from right here. Hey everyone, welcome to the Shiloh Farm, Farmer Proberg's live Q and A. We're gonna do a walk through the greenhouse. We're gonna see what Tyler's got going on. I'm gonna ask him a bunch of questions about how they grow, when to up pot, what different uh, plants you need to be planting this time of year, and answer all your guys' questions. So, Mr. Farmer Froberg, why don't you take it away, introduce yourself, and then tell yep. us a little bit about what you guys got growing on. Well, first off, howdy, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is our first YouTube Live ever. It is our first YouTube Live. Turned, turned into a video. Um, we're, we're figuring so it out as we go, you know? My name is Tyler Froberg, also known as Farmer Froberg on the World Wide Web. I'm a fourth generation diversified fruit and vegetable farmer in the Gulf Coast of Texas. Love it. So the ground that I'm standing on right now was bought by my great grandfather in 1936. Now, fun fact, the, the physical square foot ground that I'm standing on was in 1936. Probably somewhere between 1936 and the 50s, he raised Duroc pigs on. So wow. he had wow. strawberries in the field. He raised strawberries for nursery plants and sold them to the other strawberry farmers around. He, my great grandfather, went to vet school, and so um, he really liked the critters and he raised Duroc pigs. And fun fact, he free ranged them. He let them out every morning, and they would travel around the farm, and then they would come back in the evening. And he wasn't worried about anybody taking his pigs or they just. Nope. They, they got conditioned to it. Wow. And so this was, you guys are a fourth generation strawberry farm too. I didn't realize that he was the one that started the strawberries. Yep. Yep. He's so our area specifically within like 10 miles because we have Sandy loam soil um, has always been high in strawberry production. Was it, were the strawberries like native to that area then? No, gosh, no. But um, we had, it was a perfect storm, right? So in the late 1800s, uh, when Alvin, the town was founded, they built the railroad to Galveston. And so you had, you had, you know, 10, approximately 10 or more square miles of sandy loam soil. You had people already growing figs and pears. You had strawberries. And so, and you had one of the largest fig processing facilities right by where they put the train depot at and so it's a perfect storm to become a hub for not just processed figs pears and strawberries but fresh fruit to get on the train they pack it full of ice the train and send it down here they these guys would fill it full of berries and send it back up north that's crazy hundred yeah. years well no, i guess not quite a hundred years but just well not quite not a hundred years here but the frobergs came over in 1890s and started farming. So actually, I'm technically fifth generation, just okay. fourth generation on this ground. So in the 1890s, my great great grandfather farmed 15 acres of strawberries on the other side of Alvin. Man, yeah. Well, I could talk to you about strawberries probably, okay. all day, but I know that you are short on time. So I want to see what you've got going on behind you in your greenhouse, because as you can see. In mine, I've got a much smaller version of what you're doing, and I have a lot of questions about yes. how to grow properly. So why don't you walk us through, I guess, start to finish um, the process yes. of growing in your guys' greenhouse. So what I'd like to do first is talk about like our scheduling and okay. how we time everything, and then I can go th like through a demo of how I physically seed. That'd be perfect. So, Let's see it. Flip this camera around. So... Each one of these sections is a week by week. Now, most of the plants that you see in here are going to be sold in our store. Um, okay. And then a lot of the peppers and tomatoes will be planted in the field. But any of the herbs you see here will be sold in the store. So here you have week week one. and That was all in one week? Or you're just saying this is the start of week one? Yes. So, so from here... To where the plants get a little bit smaller right there is all of this was seeded week one. So okay. not January 1st, but the first week that we started seeding. And so how, how old are those plants right there? So these plants are about three weeks old. Okay. So you yep. started three weeks ago. This was week started one. Three weeks ago. This was yep. week one. Um, go on. Now, you people here, when they see my videos, they hear one seed per hole, one seed per hole, one seed per hole. I always put the clarification that there are, of course, exceptions. 
some of these exceptions include herbs, especially herbs for resale. And so like, as an example, people will buy this at our store, but they won't plant it. They'll just wait till the cilantro gets a little bit bigger and they'll harvest it out of here. Yeah. And so, you know, I always put the disclaimer in there. When I say one seed per hole, I'm, I'm talking about the, the crops that you're going to be transplanting into the field um, one by one. Okay. Right? Seed, seed, you shouldn't be wasting money buying double or triple the amount of seed. But we'll get into we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But okay. so here is week one, and I apologize for the noise. We'll walk over to the chicken brooder a little bit later. But we're converting our other greenhouse right beside here into the chicken into a chicken brooder. So peppers, tomatoes, all looking really good. These are all about three weeks old. Okay. Now I see cilantro here. We started at cilantro up there, so this starts week two. Okay. And so all of these got seeded two weeks ago. And of course we see quicker germination in the herbs and we see little tiny baby bee pepper plants just starting to come up here. Oh yeah. Yep. So those are two week old peppers. Of course, tomatoes germinate just a little bit faster, right? We see all of our little tomatoes careful on the one seed per hole here. We see that we're not going to waste a bunch of time thinning here. Sure. Yep. And so, then we start with week three over here. Now with week three, we're actually going to see more trays than we did week one and two. Now that's because that's we're going a lot to... more there. Are these the ones you guys are planting for yourself or are these also? So for... this will include more that we're going to be planting for ourselves. But okay. by the time these are ready, we're going to be well into March, which would be prime plant selling time. Sure. So you're you're scheduling them based on when it's going to be the most effective. Exactly. Time. Yeah. Exactly. And so we'll go through I, here now. It's killing me. How come that one tray isn't right there where it needs to be? Oh, I know, right? It should be. That it needs they, to go that, right there. This ah. is. It should be because of the variety, right? Oh, All of those are the same variety. Those are the same variety. Somebody so, messed up, though. Somebody messed up. How do yeah. you say? <laughs> I'm blaming you, Tyler. Uh, yeah, is you know everything's my fault. Yeah, <laughs> but so again, you see just a lot more because we're going to be in prime, and a lot of these are for us too. And so we know if we're going to be transplanting in the field March seventh, right, March fifteenth, these will be perfectly ready for that. And yeah. so, you know, we do the same rotation week by week for in-store sales, and then increase them based on demand and what we'll be using in the field. And then these are flowers. These will actually, we can pot, we'll pot these up into four inch pots and these will sit in the four inch pots a little bit longer than some of your vegetables will. So I have a uh, question, but yeah, we'll, and you maybe get to that in a little bit, but I do have a question on when you know it's the right time to up pot. Cause especially some of those things you were working on the dill that was three weeks old, Obviously, maybe not ready to up pot yet, but when do you decide that's the right time? And are there ones that you don't ever up pot and you just go right from the seeding tray yep. to out in the field? So there, it's a multifaceted question. So yep. if it's for if it's for selling in the store, we're going to start it in a four inch pot so we don't have to up pot it. Okay. Okay. That's going to okay. be the goal, except for the stuff that's combo. So if it's stuff that we we will be transplanting and selling in the store then it will start in a smaller tray. We'll transplant what we can and then up pop the rest to sell in the store. Okay. Now, I had uh, a random idea. You said, sorry to interrupt you, but you said a combo. What if you were to plant your tomato, your pepper, your cilantro, your onion, like in the same tray and you sold like a salsa kit, like a salsa tray. Have you ever, you know, have you ever done that? I wonder if that would work. So, we did we did that at, when I was at Hope Farms. Like okay. we made like a salsa pot, right? Yeah. It was one large pot with everything in it. Um, yep. Really, really easy to do when there's only one person planting. But when you have a team doing a ton of trays, that tends to stuff gets messed up when you okay. do that. Um, well, somebody ends actually, up with three peppers and the other person got three tomatoes. Yeah, and yeah. actually, you know, I say that we kind of have a general rule of thumb here at the family farm, and that is. The same person actually seeded ninety percent of these trays, just so that that one the one eyes are on the same thing. They know what's going one on. One eye, yes, that's really important in the greenhouse, even for organization. 
when you have even sets of hands making making labels and seating and filling trays like stuff starts to get really confusing really quick and all of a sudden you have trays that are mislabeled um and it's just not good not good uh, okay. so you know when i was at hope farms i actually would start my tomatoes about three weeks prior than what we do here because we grow the strawberries here that fills most of our spring. So we don't need tomatoes in as early as we did at Hope Farms. And so we don't up pot as much on tomatoes like we did there. Now, the reason I would up pot there is because on January 1st, I was seeding tomatoes. From there, I, I could get four weeks in a 128 like this. Okay. And then from there, I would, you know, that that's only February 1st. Still a little risky to transplant. So we'll put them in four inch pots and try to push them to pass Valentine's day in those four inch pots. Now, okay. when do we know? Well, first off timing, you know, um, we know that if everything's going right, then most of the stuff should, should be able to be in this tray for three to four weeks. Now that kind of maybe, a general rule, like, obviously depends on the variety and what you're planting the, the plant. Yeah. Is that a general rule of thumb though? To, you're looking at about a month, yes. three to four weeks before you up pot. Yes, three weeks on some of your quicker stuff, four weeks on some of your slower stuff. Um, but there's multiple things that go into that. If you're not someone who's feeding in your greenhouse, that's going to slow everything down. If you're not someone who's watering consistently in your greenhouse, that's going to slow everything down. And so easiest, we don't have anything that would be ready to transplant. Let me try. We got offered some old seed, these peas here. And so we wanted to do a germination test on them before we took okay. them up on it and so this yeah. was a little germination test so i'll do it on this so to check to see if it's ready to up pot what i like to do remember when you're taking anything out of a container all you do is squish the bottom don't squish the top and then we'll lightly pull that one wouldn't quite be ready to transplant you see how it kind of fell apart if the root structure didn't hold your soil together exactly that's what we want now we don't want it to be to, to root bound we don't want it to be like just all roots down here in the soil but we would like it to stay together and I can say, I have lots of people that have asked me in the past, oh my gosh, my peppers have just quit growing. Like they're in the tray, they're not very big, they just quit growing. So I tell them, well, try pulling one out of the tray. And when they do, it's just like solid roots. And I'm like, up pot it. And the minute they up pot it, golly, it two and a half off. weeks later, it's like, yeah, it just takes off. And so depending on, you know, most people have no idea what kind of fertilizer is in their seeding mix. Uh, if any, and then if you are feeding from that, like how much each plant's actually getting. And so you just don't know what type of nutritional plan. A lot of people don't that these small plants are on. You could be building stronger root systems instead of trying to grow green growth, right? Lots of variables there. Sure. And so I, I like up potting, especially with smaller greenhouses where if you need plants to be in there longer or, you have slower growing plants. I really like up potting. I think it's a good technique. So in my situation, right, I've got my trays. We're, we're not get, get this, Tyler. It's supposed to get down to negative 10 on Monday and Tuesday. So I, I'm not to the point where I'm going to be putting anything in yet. We are getting ready to go. But the 72-inch trays here that I have, per your suggestion, these ones are 72s. You were having a one. Is it 128? A 128. Oh. I I like the 72s for someone your size because okay. like on your tomatoes and peppers, you're going to get a little bit longer in there before you have to up pot. And then you're going to get a little bit longer out of that up pot. So I could, I could leave that like a tomato most likely could stay in here for maybe five to six weeks before I need to up pot it. Let's say four to five weeks. Okay. Four to five. Let's say four to five weeks. Uh, maybe six weeks, like if you're, if you're not feeding, you know what I mean? But ideally at six weeks, it would be, you know, you'd be ready to transplant. Now, another, or, but, another question on the four, the four inch pots versus mm -hmm. the six inch, this is, or not a six inch, a six, six tray. Yeah. Do I need to put, if I'm selling these, you just plant the tomato right in here, right? That's what I do. Um, yeah, you know, there's. There's larger, so think about it this way. So if you were growing 10,000 trays and each 
each one of those six trays missed one plant. Well, all of a sudden you, you have 60,000 plants that you've, that you've missed out on. Oh yeah. I, but so that's where if you were growing 10,000 trays, then it would be more beneficial to start them in 128s and transplant them. So you can be, you can ensure that when you have that six cell, every single one has a plant that's growing. But if you're only growing a hundred trays and every tray is missing one, well, that's okay. okay. You know, not that big that's a deal. Okay. Yeah. Not that I don't think it's that big of a deal. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's my philosophy on it. It's, it's a scale thing. Uh, but yeah, if I was you, I would just direct seed into those. The, the stuff that I'm going to sell and then, or even take some of these, the 72 cell up pot that use that for like my herbs and things up pot to a four, four inch pot and sell that. Yep. I really like, like for selling, I like those sixers for like your brassicas. Yeah. Right. And then I really like four inches for tomatoes and peppers and things like that. Yeah. And maybe walk, sprinkle, you know, walk me through on. kind of a list. You, you, you gave me four things there, but name, name off some of the things you would put in a six cell versus a four inch pot. Yeah. Sorry. The train was passing by. So You're I believe what you said was give me a list of what you put in each. Yeah. <laughs> so the four inch pots, I really like for herbs, but you'll eliminate my one seed for, for whole rule and you'll yep. put a few herbs in there and it just grows a real nice four inch. And I tell your customers, don't plant those, just harvest them right out. They'll get big in there. Just harvest them right out of there or transplant that just into a bigger pot and pick it right out of there. You know, uh, I really like the four inchers for tomatoes and peppers, up potting them into that and selling them. Uh, eggplant, a lot of your like later spring or maybe what you would consider summer stuff, what I would consider spring stuff. Uh, if we were doing okra, I'd probably put okra in that in that four inch pot. And then on the six tray, I really like all your brassicas. So cabbage, kale, broccoli, cauliflower. Uh, Head lettuce. Uh, I really like that. They, they're quick growing. Uh, they're really quick growing and they'll, they'll fill out those six inch pots pretty quick versus waiting for a tomato to fill out. Like you'd have better luck. Like if you're going to up pot it, up pot it into the four inch pot, right? Well, and uh, you're able to, you're able to take those brassicas and put them into the ground a lot sooner. So like in my case, if I'm planting tomatoes now, I am not putting them out until the end of April, first part of May. So it's like, I, I would have to be up potting those. I can't put yeah. them in the ground, but the cold, yeah. cold tolerant ones, you can get in a lot earlier. Yeah. So that's a good point. It'd be hard to carry a tomato in that six, six cell pot or six cell tray that long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, a lot of people, they don't, tr they obviously direct seed things like radishes, beets and turnips. However, if you're in a situation where you want to try to get a head start on some of that stuff, you can do it you can transplant them. It can be done. But again, you'll need to eliminate my one seed per cell rule. If you, if you try to tr grow beets in a tray and try to transplant those and you put one seed per cell, you're not going to build enough root system in that cell to hold all the soil together. Yeah. So you need to put three or four in there and build a nice little, little root system in there. And then you can transplant it. Same with the turnips and radishes. You can transplant them, but you need to put them in the smallest cell possible and put two or three seeds in there. So they'll hold them together whenever you. So definitely you want the 128 on those. Or smaller. So they make a, a, a 264. Wow. Yeah. Man. Uh huh. 264 is what we used before if we were transplanting beets. Okay. And you guys have even transplanted corn, right? Do you do that in a six? Yeah. Cell? Actually, the, the corn did really good in the 128s. Okay. Uh, and so where areas where that could be really good are areas where you don't have, and this goes for all this direct seeded stuff, areas that you don't really have a good like overhead irrigation system. And so you have a really hard time, like completely soaking your soil to get irrigation or sorry, to get good germination. That's where I like to transplant some of those more untraditional transplant crops, right? 
so crops that you would normally direct seed like corn, radishes, beets. Uh, I've never done carrots. I've always direct seeded carrots, uh, yeah. but I'm sure you could do it that way too. Uh, and just put it in the smallest cell possible. Now the corn, I only put one seed per cell because it's just got such a vibrous root system. Um, and dude, talk about, talk about a pretty little corn patch because just every transplant is just laid out perfectly right where it needed to be right where it needed to be. You obviously you're getting quicker germination and really healthy plants going into the field. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's, I think it, it's super interesting. Uh, you know, if you were a little bit larger and had one of those, um, uh, tape transplanters. Yeah. I don't know if you see those, right. A uh, paper pot transplanter and did corn and something like that. I think you would, it would do really well because you could transplant it really quick, right? Just drag it, those paper pots pull apart. And it would be think, right well, where they need to be. Big time. That's, not how we, that's not how we do it up here in Nebraska, I'll tell you that. Well, that's not how we do it either. It's yeah, just I know. something, I know. you know, like I just tried it one time just to see. And, uh, you know, at Hope Farms, I never had great overhead irrigation get germination on, on certain let's, fields. Let's talk about there. irrigation because that is something that I need to figure out here. I'm just planning on taking a hose and spraying things down, but what would be your yeah. ideal situation? Honestly, man, I, I love this question because look, look what's sitting right there. <laughs> Hopefully um, exactly what I, I'm looking I, at. Yeah. Dude, I just don't trust it. Um, and, and yes, is it going to create more work for you? Of course. And do big commercial greenhouses have timers and water lines and all that? Yes. But like a, it, you're adding to the cost of each of your plants because you happen to install that infrastructure. And then B, all it takes is one warm day and that timer to, to malfunction and it's game over. Like it's, it's game over, right? So every day is critical. What you're, the way you're saying is like you need to be out here, water them every single day. Yes. And so I look at this just like raising chick. Like those those first three to four weeks are the most critical part. You know, once the chick feathers out and you've given it all the nutrition it needs, it's good, right? But like you got to you kind of have to really watch them those first couple of weeks. And I look at the greenhouses the same way. And it's the most important thing. It's, it's where everything starts. If you fail in here, you don't even get the opportunity to succeed or fail out there. Yeah, it's a good perspective. So you just get it moist on top, make sure that it's, you want it really saturated every day? Yes, and so I don't like to see a single dry cell. I think my uncle has a little bit of a different philosophy that uh, if you kind of let them go not get it completely dry, but you let it get a little bit dry and then soak it again. Two different philosophies. You end up at the same, um, at the same end goal. Uh, is his for more root growth? Like he's wanting to promote the root yes. growth there? He's promoting root growth. And honestly, he's probably even promoting a little bit more drought tolerance too, right? Like we forget that it's not just about varietal selection, but it's also about like raising hardier plants. The environment and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. situation they, they have exactly that this batch of plants has the ability to adapt if you ease them into something and so there's i guess there, there's a lot to be said i am like on the other viewpoint of like no we need to have as many successful plants as possible <laughs> yeah so two different viewpoints the same end goal for the most part um yeah you guys but, should do a trial like a, a side by side he gets one side you get the other and you see how they turn yeah. out end of the year well so like i more than likely what would happen is is you have the trays that i did would probably look a lot better before they were transplanted the right. trays that he did would right. look a lot better directly after transplanting yeah. and then you know yeah. the hardiness would be going you know a week out two weeks out three weeks out four weeks out all the way to harvest i don't know you know? yeah um yeah it's the greenhouse is a whole thing but if I could say, like, obviously, if you're on the homestead or if you're raising plants for your garden, it's just one person. But if you do have a small farm like this, pick one person. 
and they need to be doing everything in the greenhouse. Even if you send people to help them, like have them create the system and understand what's going on. And if you do send somebody to help them, they should only be doing things like filling the trays with soil and then setting them there so that the person who's running the greenhouse can seed them, label them and place them. Right. Labeling. You brought up that point. And what do you guys do to label your, your trays? So Popsicle I've tried sticks. a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. I've tried a bunch of different stuff, everything from popsicle sticks to plastic tags. Um, I mean, the plastic tags truthfully work the best. Let me see because what you got on there. Gonna... Zoom in on one of those. I want to see what that looks like. Because yep. they last forever. Now, these okay. are for resale. And so these don't have like the variety of cilantro it is. That's probably Calypso cilantro. Um, if we were putting it out in the field, it'd have the variety and all that good stuff. I like to put the seed date on it. Uh, okay. And then there was even a time where we were having germination problems at Hope Farms. And so I put... Variety, so what it is, variety, date it was seeded, and then seed company that I got it from. Oh, wow. Okay. Only because I wanted to see, like, okay, if if we seeded 36 trays of red snapper tomatoes, and half of them were from one X seed company, and half of them were from Z seed company, and all the Z ones didn't fail, well, we have a problem on our hands. Sure. And then you can compare even that company's maybe the red to the red snapper tomato didn't work from X company, but the okra that you got, you can compare different companies across different plants. Exactly, exactly. Because of course every co every company has their own genetics. Yeah. Uh, and so just because just because it's the same variety doesn't mean it's they're all created equal. You know, of course. I mean, you've been in the seed business before. You know. There, there are some stuff that they're they're all buying from the same place. Yes, course, but even right? that, you talk about seed handling. There's a lot of different variables that go into the humidity that's there, where they're storing that seed, uh, the temperature that it's in, how long they've actually had it. So even if they all got it from the same place, over a period of six months, the germination at, at one company could be completely different from another company. Exactly. So... Let's talk about Let's how the actual problem. I'm excited. I, I feel like a, a kid in middle school again, I'm at, and I'm at a field trip. Let me make sure that you're going to be able to actually see down in here. So, okay, 128 cells. Sorry, you can't see my face. 128 cells. Okay, so there's cell. 128 cells in that. This is a yep. 70. We put, we put our soil in a like a big uh, trough. Right. Lots of people have their propagation station set up differently. We like this. Um, it's just it makes it really easy to work in. The tray fits in the tub. No problem. Um, just makes it a little easier. I always wet my soil down. OK, it shouldn't be sopping, but it shouldn't be dusty. That's the, okay. that's the spot. Like you shouldn't be able to wring water out when you do it, but it also shouldn't be dusty. So it's about finding that sweet spot. Now, this is important because this is this soil is hydrophobic, meaning that it won't absorb water well if it's dry. It'll only absorb water well if it's wet. So that's why, like, I, I did this last year. When I would put water over my soil, it just ran right off the top. That's, exactly. that's why that happens. So you let your soils dry out too much. That's okay. why. I am really big on keeping those plants watered because all it takes is one warm day for them to dry out. And then it's really hard to reach that saturation point. again. Okay. Cause it just continues to, could you yeah. soak the tray? Like, would you be able to take the tray and set it in some water for, and I don't, there's a, it's called bottom watering. There's a lot yeah. of people who do that, that like to do it on this scale would take so much time. Really. Sure. If you do become dry like that, the best thing to do, is take like two hours and go in there and water every 15 minutes and that'll slowly but surely creep it down um sure. you know before we get started on that we need to talk about watering time too if you if you have like a greenhouse your size for example and it only takes you 10 minutes to water it you're not watering correctly okay right okay now, it should be longer you should be 
filling up each tray very lightly. It shouldn't think about like, think about what your garden looks like after a hard rain, right? Yeah. It shouldn't be a hard water. It should be a very light water. You should be completely soaking the tray all the way around and then starting back at the beginning. We like to do that four times all the way around. And if you're not sure if you're watering correctly, once your plants start to be, be kind of established, you can lightly take one of those cells out and look. Is the wa How far are you penetrating the water? Is the soil dry at the very bottom? Then you're not watering long enough. How long do you... How long after you've watered do you do that test? Um, 10, 15 minutes. That okay. should be plenty. No, yeah. So, fill the tray. And here's what I'm thinking, Tyler. I think we need to have you back on maybe sometime this week, and we can talk strictly about the potting soil versus seed starting mix. I think that would be a good video to do. So we'll, we'll address that in a, in a later video. Yes. So then we have our, our handy dandy scraper here, which is really just an old piece of wood. Is that, like is that to, a piece of pallet wood or something? Yeah, probably. I like to take it, scrape the top, not to the end, right? I don't know if y'all, y'all can't see that. So I don't scrape it fully to the end. Okay. Scrape it to the edge there. And then I take it and scrape it back the other way. Mm. And we get a really nice covered area. And then move y'all back a little bit this is like my super secret i but i tell everybody because we don't gatekeep anything super secret but not secret yeah i take another tray instead of using my finger or a pen or buying an expensive dibble tray i just dibble with another tray because you've got so a I'll, hole right in the bottom of your I'm trying to see if I've got one of those trays. Well, so you don't you don't need a hole. You just need that soil to be indented, right? Like where this thought process was that we need like a little tiny hole, we don't. All I did was indent. You see how all the squares are indented now? Because all it did was make the shape of the bottom of that, right? Okay, yeah. So picture this perlite as seeds. We'll just drop one seed in each, right? Take it. Lightly cover. Right? Take your tray again. That gives you good seed to soil contact. Put it on the line. Man, you made that look easy. I'm, That's the goal, though, right? right. Using the, the upper... Using the other tray to dibble is, to me, the game changer. Because, again, most people, you'll see them, they'll go like this. It takes so much time. Yeah. So using that other tray to dibble. So are you going to have seeds that are like, instead of being perfectly in the in the center of the cell, they're going to be off to the Yeah, it's going to happen. Guess what? But that, but that doesn't matter at the end of the day. Yeah. Like where it the plant is really that. doesn't care that much. And Especially I guess the other thing... The other thing that people don't realize when you're poking the hole with your finger is the depth. You're going to get, at the, end, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter that much, but you are going to get different emergence because you might have one that's a half inch and another that's Correct. a quarter of an inch, and it's it's going to definitely come up a little odd. Exactly. And this so it might not stop emergence. Yeah, doing having inconsistent holes like that, it might not stop emergence, but like you said, you're going to have a bunch of different timing. Yeah. This, it's all the same. Consistent. I like that. Y'all uh, want to see the chicken brooder? Let's see Hi. it. Yeah, I'm excited. Hello, Andreas. Andreas? I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but welcome. Yes, let's so, see you're working on. How many, how many uh, hens do you have ordered? So we have 1,000 hens ordered. We have 800 red stars. We have 100 speckled Sussex, and we have 100 Rhode Island Reds. Man, that's awesome. So, so this, this was a green converted greenhouse. <clears throat> yep, this is this was the greenhouse. We just started on it, on it about three weeks ago. Is the so, plastic the same, or did you guys replace that? We, we replaced it only because this didn't have plastic on it. If okay. it would have had plastic on it, we just could have cut half of it off. But it didn't have any plastic on it, so... 
So just starting from this side, right from the front, you, if you can see in the screen, we have chicken wire actually going around the entire bottom section all the way around. Okay. Right. Um, and we did that. There's actually, we're actually going to put bird netting over this. That'll run the link. But we did that just so this bottom piece would have a little bit more security on it. Um, each one of these windows opens. We actually haven't cut the plastic yet just because it's like, why, why do it yet? Right? <laughs> like yeah, wait, have it buckled up it. for when the chicks get, once they get feathered out and we need airflow, we'll just take a knife, zip, 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 and open the window up. But for now it's buckled up window nice. right here as well. Door, of course, door that seals tight, right? And now, if how we did needed you keep that to, door to seal tight, because <laughs> that is the hardest yeah. part for me. Um, we have some really talented carpenters on our team okay. that understand making things square and yeah, you know, all that good stuff. And then, of course, you have the door stop here. Now, that's a big thing too, because if you continuously allow that door to swing past, it'll start to wear on those hinges because they're not meant to swing that way. So having yeah. that door stop is important. And if we wanted to, we could actually run a piece of tape here if it was going to get real cold, you know? Yeah. So we have gas hookup, we have electrical hookup, and we have water hookup. I'm so jealous. I got nothing in my greenhouse. Full, like it's, it's a smart yeah. That Having that is so, like if you guys are putting in anything like this, a greenhouse or a, a brooder, and you're wanting to use that, having – Access to water and electricity is so important. Yeah, for sure. So here, the way the way this will look once it's finished, there'll be a, a piece of plywood that comes from that to here. And then it's going to go in right there. That way the chicks, when we open this door to come in, we're not like trying to keep chicks out of the door, right? Yeah. It'll block them off. Um. Uh, when they first arrive, we're going to build brooders inside this giant brooder. There'll be four brooders, eight by eight, 250 chickens apiece, with gas heaters that come out and heat lamps. Um, the water line will have automatic waters that just trace the edge of this square That's all the way down. Hard. Yeah, so we'll have about 100 emitters going all the way around. The little, uh, the little dribble thing, right? Yep. What, yep. What did exactly. you use for the emitter? That's what it is. It's like the little. It's got a little thing that comes out of it, and when they hit it, it drops water out. Uh, how many chickens do you have, Tyler? How many are you gonna get? One more time. We just ordered a thousand. They'll have a thousand laying hands. So, we just put these poles up this morning. That's meant because we're gonna hang feeders up there. And so these are meant to stop that from bowing. Sure. That's all that's for. Uh, and even if we, if we looked at it and we really didn't like hanging them there, what we could actually do is run a two by four from there to there. And just hang them from there. Yeah, just hang them from there. Either way, we have that support system in. And so yeah. once, once these birds get four to six weeks old, depending on the weather, again, we have vent windows here and here as well. We just, my uncle and I just this morning seeded, you can kind of see it, some ryegrass and some clover out here. Nice. So there'll be bird netting. You can see the chicken wires here. There'll be bird netting all the way over here. What, what they talk a lot about in the pastured poultry scene is like giving your birds, especially if you're somewhere where there's extreme weather, giving your birds that transition period. Sure. So. Four to you're six not, weeks. You're taking right from this perfect environment and then throwing them outside. Exactly. So four to six weeks, we'll open up the door during the day and allow them to come. This will be, you know, six inches tall with ryegrass and clover. They'll be able to graze in here. <clears throat> and then at the end of the day, lock them all in there um, until they're ready to go out on pasture. That's going to be perfect. Wow. We're, we're pretty, dude, we put a lot of thought into this. Do you mind, you can, you can say no to this, but do you mind telling us how much like this entire setup would cost? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we already had the greenhouse, so like we don't count that cost because we've already made it back 
from. But what would what would like if they were yeah. wanting to pull these so up new? This this greenhouse probably cost. I'm gonna say eight thousand. Okay. Maybe six to eight thousand, depending on where you are, right? Yeah. Uh, and then probably it's we've probably only spent five hundred in lumber. Okay. The the plastic was another three hundred. Okay. Probably what five hundred in chicken wire going around it. And then the the four hundred dollar bird net. Were you adding up? <laughs> no, I wasn't adding up. I was actually thinking in my head. I was wondering. I bet you could find. I bet you could find a used greenhouse because a lot of times what happens is once that plastic's done, and somebody doesn't want it anymore, they'll they'll cut you a really good deal on just getting the the framing down if you'll yeah. come take it down. Well, so, so and that, that brings up the good question, like. You know, now that this greenhouse has kind of played out and like you said, the plastic was ripping, maybe some of the poles are a little rusty. It's almost of better use for us to make it into the brooder because we need the brooder. You know, if yeah. it was all, if most of this wood was just salvaged from the farm, and like so I mean, this, this has paint on it, like this yeah. is all salvaged wood, right? It's different sizes, like. So my question is, so these are going to go from the brooder and then you're going to have them out on a pasture. And when we can talk about that, you've got a, a chicken tractor. Will this brooder then sit empty or do you think that you could then throw more layers in it come summertime? Is it too hot down there where you could end up selling chickens in the fall? Like ones that you guys don't need yeah. just that brooder going. So we've brainstormed multiple ideas. And so we kind of thought about brooding our pigs in here. Okay. Um, but then we're like, do we, we don't want to risk that cross contamination. So I don't think we're going to do that. Yeah. yeah. And so I think what we're going to do is we'll let it sit. Now our plan is we will have a thousand chicks in here every year. Yeah. And so, but we'll actually be ordering in October. And so by next October, this will be full again. That's the plan. Okay. Okay. Uh, you wanna you wanna have a little sneak peek at the trailer we're turning into the chicken wagon? I do. Wagon? I do. This is the this will be the next step. So you'll take them from the brooder. They'll have access to the outdoors and the brooder, and then this is where they'll go for their permanent home, right? Exactly. And so we just got that hundred acre lease, and so half of it will be peas, summer peas, and the other half will be pasture chickens okay we just had a question about the podcast when are we coming out with season two we are going to be filming here in the next week or two right yeah. Ted? we've got we're planning i had a question about it yesterday too i said look we're planning we'll be recording a few episodes here soon and uh we're excited about season two we started um the first season in in march of 2022 so i think what we'll do is probably just keep that same schedule come out in march and uh run through well, was it September? And yep. do that for, for season two. I appreciate you listening, though. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the goal is to make this as easy as possible for us, right? While Always. eggs are obviously eggs are obviously like a profitable revenue stream, especially right now. It still doesn't need to add a ton of stuff to the operation. And so you can see we if you could see that, we've been testing our electric netting. We have it set up over here. So this electric netting will follow. It will surround the chicken wagon, the egg wagon. And that is, will you guys move that every day? Or how long no, are you hoping? No, it'll get, it'll get moved twice a week. Okay. It'll be on a quarter acre. And so okay. here is the trailer. So it'll have a pitched roof. Right, it'll have feeders that hang down the side. This these sides will be the brooders, and then we're going to have every 50 feet along this hundred acres is going to be a stub up, a, a water spigot with a with an air hose hookup, and so we will have pipes, automatic waterers that run the entire perimeter. 
of this trailer and that that ho that uh, air hose will be hooked up to it it'll you know how the air hose things roll up yeah it'll roll it so when we move it we'll unplug it from the hose bib let it roll up we'll move the trailer and then we'll plug it back in so we never have to haul water we don't have to fill waters one one suggestion for you on that when you build this if you can get a, a sprinkler head either at the front or the back end of your trailer, most likely you'd want it on the back. You could also use that to, to irrigate. So you could run you know a sprinkler what? back at the same time. When we went to that chicken conference, they talked about that. They talked they about say? the importance of irrigating all, all that manure in after yeah. you've moved. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, I just, there was a comment there. I'm sorry, I just missed it. Uh, I don't know what eggs cost in the U.S., but my neighbor in Denmark sells them to us for thirty-seven U.S. Dollars. Oh my word! Whoa, that'd we be nice. are not that high. That'd be nice. Um, and so this will just get moved with just a small tractor, right? And that tractor will carry the feed and all that. <laughs> and so right now, our plan is to move Tuesdays and Fridays. Weekends are crazy busy here. <laughs> uh, and so we don't want to be moving on the weekends. Um, and so Tuesdays and Fridays right now is the goal. I like it. What's the dinosaur for? I know that's way random, but. Yeah. So, you know, we do agritourism. And so this is okay. just, this is what we call a photo op. Okay. People like to take pictures in front of it. I like it. I like it. I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna hop over to Instagram real quick. I'm gonna see if there's any questions real quick. Yeah, do that. I'll keep walking. You keep walking. All right, y'all. This was where our corn maze was this past season. This is where a lot of the tourism happens. People come in here, they take pictures. We call this like the yard, basically. Um, Easter egg hunts, picture What's taking. What's the next event that you guys will be, like a big event? You can do the corn mazes, you've got strawberry picking. Is yeah. there anything you'll do for Valentine's Day? Well, so we might do some like chocolate dipped strawberries for Valentine's Day, but it won't be uh -huh. anything out here. That'll be in the store. Okay. Um, so we will do spring break, which is like our strawberry festival, where like it, it's more than just the strawberry picking. They'll be able to come all in here, play the games and stuff, take a tractor ride. And that'll run for a week during spring break. Um, it's kind of muddy, but we're going to walk out to the strawberries. All right. And so, yes, this is a farm that you can visit. This is a uh, Froberg's farm in Alvin, Texas. That's right. Did we have any questions on Instagram? We did. Um, one question was, what do you do with your older birds? Do you eat them? Do you give oh. them to people? So I can tell you what our plan is going to be. Not Obviously, we haven't done it yet, but our plan right now is um, one, of, one of, I guess, two options. So the first option is sell them off at five bucks a bird. Like, because we'll, we, a, a chicken won't stay on the farm any longer than two years. And so there will, there's a small market, obviously for homeowners who, you know, they don't, they don't care that they're only getting 200 X a year or 180 or whatever. Right. So let me explain that real quick for people who don't know a chicken will start laying typically around six months. It just don't depends on the breed and then it'll continue to the production will continue to increase until they get to about 18 months is where it's dramatically starts to decrease and so the cost to feed the chicken versus what you're getting out of eggs isn't doesn't pencil out for big egg uh, producers and so usually at 18 months to two years they'll sell off those even though they can continue to lay until they're six to eight years old they're not laying as much it continues to decline and so people will sell off those birds to people like myself that have a homestead. They're not, we're not in it to make a bunch of money. Yep. And so the other option is, um, is obviously like to stew them. Um, yep. 
we we make tamales here on the farm. We make all you know all sorts of stuff, and so um, who doesn't love chicken tamales? <laughs> yep. And that also because with the breed that you have, you could definitely get some meat off of those. Like I know the the uh, white highline ones. You're it's not even worth butchering. Like there's no meat on them sure. whatsoever. So the the breed also makes a big difference too on what you do so with them afterwards. We figure like the special Sussex is a kind of a heavier bird. That one for sure. Yep. We could. Your Rhode Island uh, Red, you could do the same as well. Yeah. Man, uh, I want one. What's the blue? What's the blue rope? And you got a. Yep. Yeah. What is that great, for? Great questions. So this is to hold that the remake off. So really important during frost protection, and uh, I always find that people this is like the thing they forget about covering plants is. Yes, if you cover your plants, is it going to help them? Of course. But if you want full protection, you don't want that cloth to touch the leaf. Because if that cloth freezes, you now have frost sitting on that leaf. And, and it's good because it's only sitting on the top ones or maybe the outside ones. But, like, those are going to be burned. If you've ever gone yeah. through a freeze where you have things covered, when you uncover, you're like, oh, they only took a light burn. Well, that's that light burn was from that cloth touching touching it so this keeps that that remay off of the plants so how far will that go you you have to cover all those up in an in event of a frost we just we just covered them two days ago okay yep and then and then we uncovered them <laughs> and so sometimes unfortunately like there's times where we might cover and uncover two to three times in one week like because you can't just, leave them covered for like how long could you leave them covered? Um, you normally you don't want to leave them covered up for like more than four days because like your fruit is ripening under there. You're on a time clock. Yeah, and so that's why it's not unheard of to leave them covered for four days, uncover, pick, and then cover them back up. Oh, okay. You can see this cloth. This cloth blew off during the freeze. And that's why those plants look like that. Because if you see just huh. past that, they're, you know, they look eight great. inches tall. Um, yeah, I hate that that great. happened right here at the beginning of the field. Because when people walk out here, it's the first thing they see. Yeah, yeah. But, like, you go into here and, oh, my gosh, the difference. <laughs> we see a lot of almost ripe. We see a ton of green fruit. And we see a ton of blooms. So, Uncle Alfred's definitely on to something saying by February 10th. For sure. We had another question about, about chickens, which is what can chickens not eat? Oh, that's all you, buddy. That's all me. Um, they definitely do want, you want to stay away from any kind of heavily processed foods. I think that's kind of a no brainer. So I posted a video yesterday about the conspiracy theory around feeding chickens. And I had a lot of people say, what about feeding them table scraps? You can definitely feed them table scraps, but just remember that when grandma and grandpa were feeding them table scraps, that's all they fed. They were eating a lot of natural foods, a lot of greens, a lot of fruits and veggies. And in our case, we're eating a lot more processed things in our food, even if it's not, you know, something you got fast food, just in what we typically eat in our diet. So be careful of that. The things you really want to stay away from is any type of chocolate, avocados, um, any type of legume. So like beans and peanuts are really not good for them. Green tomatoes, stay away from those. Green peppers. Um, you can feed them those as long as they're ripe. Really any other fruits, most of your fruits are going to be totally okay like that. The strawberry that Farmer Froberg there was picking on. Totally <laughs> How did it taste, buddy? Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to give anybody FOMO or anything, but like, it was so good. <laughs> I've had, I've had a strawberry from that field. And yeah. so the fact that I was there makes me really like, I'm having a food memory right now. Yeah. And very so like you know you're doing good when you can see the white in the field like when you when the blooms are that noticeable where you can see shades of white in the field that's that's good that's a very good thing that is a good sign someone else just said tell us a joke uh okay i'll do one that i had my uncle do the other day why do okay. why do, why do chickens love strawberries i don't know because
Wow. Wow. I, I aim to please. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. I don't have any jokes. I'm not a I'm not a joke person, so I don't know that I can answer that question. Damn. Well, we got about five minutes left here before we need to wrap up. Tyler, what else you got going on at the farm this week? So you you cover the the strawberries up, or they're done? You think you're out of the frost warning? Yeah, I I think we're good. I think we'll probably stay uncovered all the way through the rest of strawberry season. Hopefully, um, we'll we'll look to start hopefully open the field opening the field up to the public in a couple of weeks. Um, you and know, how many people will you guys have out there picking strawberries? You know, it varies. I know through the corn maze this past year, we ran about 100,000 people through. Uh, this 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 is only about 12 acres, 10 acres of strawberries. So, like, that, that number is just not realistic for this many berries. And so, you know, maybe 30,000 is probably a good number to, to think about. So, if you sell out, all the berries are gone, what stops you from planting more strawberries next year? Um, nothing like right now, you know, in the past it was labor. Um, but yeah, I think next year we will like, you see where the strawberries stop there. We'll at least take them to like where these onions are, maybe through where these collards are. Can we see? Yeah. Let's see those onions and collards. I don't see how far those are. Yeah. I think these onions were planted when you were here at the farm. Yeah. They were just little. So they're, I mean, they look exactly how they should. They went through all, you know, our little freezes unharmed. Um, they're, they really love this weather right here. Are, you know, these, wet, uh, are these are these green onions? These are 1015s. Okay. So uh, they, these are a nice, nice bulb onion. Um, but yeah, they love this. I mean, overcast, wet, not hot, not cold. Like we're, we're about 65 degrees right now. Like this, this is what, this is what they like. It's a little windy. But they still, I mean, you can see they all look happy. Yeah. So those are your onions. You got collards over there too? Or yeah. Or the collards are almost done? Yeah, those collards are pretty played out. They uh, they got hit by the freeze in, in December pretty really? hard. Yeah. Um, but this morning, if you check my, I think my Instagram story has, uh, I know I sent you a video, Noah. Um, we pulled some really nice turnips, mustards. Um, and some a kale nice, out nice of bed of greens, that's for yes, sure. Yes, out of our Christmas tree farm. You know, you know where I'm talking about. Yep. So, um, that stuff looked awesome. That's interesting. Like the collards that we grow here are the, the most cold tolerant thing we can grow. Like it'll yeah. smoke, it'll smoke beets and radishes and turnips long before it'll ever affect the collard. But man, like, in December, we were, I mean, we were 15, 18 degrees for two and a half days. Yeah. Like, it was it was way more colder than we should have been. And these were not used to that. These have been growing in 70-degree weather, you know. I yeah. mean, they still look fine. We've still picked off quite a few of them, but there's, they're, they're de they definitely got damaged, you know. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Well, I'm excited. I Once I get through this last kind of cold front that we have where we'll be in the negatives, I got my heater supposed to come on Monday. I'm hoping that I can get started planting. I feel like I'm already a little behind. Like some of the stuff I, you know, peppers and mostly the collards, or not collards, most of my brassicas I definitely feel behind on, but I just didn't want to get anything in and then like this morning, it was 17 degrees in the greenhouse, so not really anything Woo. I want to do. That's not degree. great. No, no, not at all. Uh, last question was, are mules cool? Uh, they're the coolest. When, when's the last time you've, you've taken a ride on Pepper the Mule? Oh, man. It's probably been two months. Because summertime, you were, I mean, you were taking a ride on Pepper. Oh, man. I was, I was getting it, man. I'm just so busy. I was I was freaking getting it, man. Pepper Pepper's gonna get all fat and happy now and be like, "This is sweet. I, I don't have to do anything for anybody. I have to do nothing." <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. 
I need to I need to convince my wife that we need like a like a miniature donkey at the house or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> you need to get yourself a mini a little mini island. Oh. oh and then teach it teach it to pull. Turn it into an oxen. Oh, there you go. A plow. A plow yeah. cow. <laughs> plow plow cow. That's what I'll name it, plow cow. I like it. I think I think you need to take a ride on pepper sometime. I feel like you could use it. I think you're right. Why does you can see the bags under my eyes? You pepper. just you just need everyone needs to take a ride on either a horse or a mule every couple of weeks just to relax and de stress. Uh, you're you're probably right. You're probably right, buddy. So this went well. I feel like in my mind, I'm excited to get yep. this up and posted. See what I felt like I talked on. much, but I have a bad habit of doing that. No, that was exactly <laughs> what that was exactly what I wanted. I do think though that next time, I would love to talk more about getting people into the the seed starting side of it, like what what they need to purchase for the potting soil. What's the difference between cocoa core and perlite and vermiculite? You talked about fertilizers. We didn't get into any of that. What you're supposed to feed them. So I think we could definitely do another. Another yep. mini session just on that if you're up for it sometime. Uh, of course. Okay. Well, I'll let you get back to it. You enjoy the rest of your day, Farmer Froberg. All and, right. Uh, tell the missus and the family I said hi. Will do. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.